And Happy New Year to each and every one of the commissioners and also the staff. Good to see everybody. Got a beautiful smile on your face, so look like we're fixing to get into some work. <laughs> With that said and done, uh, Com Chairman Jackson is here. Commissioner uh, uh, Chairman Roberts is here. Uh, Commissioner Norton is here. Commissioner Crane is here. And Commissioner Levy is here. Uh, we do have uh, our director, Denise Malone. We have Jason. We have our two attorneys, Attorney Taylor and Attorney Smith, and we have Attorney Neal, I believe. Okay, and we got a gentleman in the audience. I don't recognize him, so <laughs> just wave your hand so we know who you are. So make sure you. Welcome, Tim. Oh, did you yeah. take Bob Weaver? Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, we can give him a little more than that if you like. Okay, okay. Well, okay, well, welcome. Okay, um, we're ready to get started, so we're going to turn it over to the attorneys, and with that said and done, I'm ready. Thank you. Um, so I am just going to go over a couple changes uh, to just a couple of my cases, and then I'll hand it over to Taylor for hers, and, and then we can... If you have any questions, you can let us know. We can discuss them. Um, on number 56, let's see. That is case number 20230455581. Uh, we're just going to amend that recommendation to close and flag. And then number 75. <clears throat> That is number 2023054691. We're going to amend that recommendation to, uh, we're going to keep the letter of warning for unlicensed activity um, and also refer it to the Attorney General's office um, because it could be a violation of TCA 4718121, which um, speaks to. Dealers that are unlicensed in Tennessee, just following advertising rules that are under our our commission's rules. Okay. And then, of course, if you have any questions about either of those, we can talk about them or save yeah, if it. If you have any questions on them. Sure. Yes, Commissioner Norton. I have that one flagged. <clears throat> Which one you get? 75. Okay. The one that was just the most talked about. We, uh, My questions about this are, um, I didn't understand fully what was going on. Maybe it's not in the narrative. But dealers sell cars via advertising all over the country in different right. states. We sell cars, and we ta we actually docu sign, or sometimes we take the paperwork. But the deal originates in our state of Tennessee, so I, I didn't see unless they were doing something. Uh, I didn't see where they were doing anything wrong. I mean, I need some more. But I, I missed one thing you said. You said the dealer is is something in the state of Tennessee. It's. Uh, well, our deal. Uh, if we if I sell a vehicle in in the state of Mississippi, and uh -huh. I, either I deliver it down there and they sign the paperwork there, or if they docu sign, the deal clearly is originated in the state of Tennessee, even though it's an e-commerce uh, uh, transaction. So my my point is, is if he lives in the state of Alabama, or his dealer's license is an Alabama dealer, and he's conducting business on the internet, and he uh, he sells a vehicle through that advertisement in the state of Tennessee, he's within his rights to sell that car here. And and I don't see, I, I didn't see the issues of this case unless I was missing something. Well, let me just summarize exactly how it happened and then we can see if that changes anything. And, uh, and if I misstated anything or wasn't clear in my summary, I apologize. So this is a Alabama licensed dealer. They are putting cars up on their Facebook page um, so a Tennessee resident saw this and said, I want to look at the car. So they met uh, the, the dealer, brought the car to Tennessee, not to the auction, but to somewhere like a, let's just say like a bank or a parking lot somewhere. That's the first time they looked at the car. They talked about it, negotiated the prices and everything, signed the paperwork there in this parking lot. So I think it's our opinion when we talked about it that that would be unlicensed activity um, because everything is taking place here. But if it's the commission's opinion that that's uh, allowed, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's our opinion that 
everything was done here. Okay, well, it wasn't that, really an internet sale, but I, it's kind of a gray area. It, it is gray. Grand, so, it is gray. But it is gray. What you said about if they negotiate the deal and they admittedly negotiate the deal on a parking lot in the state of Tennessee, that's a different scenario. But uh, but uh, my my position uh, would be as a dealer and uh, and on this commission was people sell cars all over the United States. Carvana does. Yes. Broom did until yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I saw that. <laughs> but I mean I mean it's it's a common practice to advertise in Facebook, cars dot com, Auto Trader, Cargoes, whatever, and transact. But in everybody's uh, contracts, it says for arbitration purposes or anything, it, the deal originated in the dealer's originating state. So if it was in Alabama and they consummated that deal when they delivered it and even signed documents, but I agree, I think that is great. If they negotiated on the parking lot, you know, and did the deal, admittedly in the parking lot, and then yes. they have an issue with that. But it wasn't clear on, on this case to that effect. So I just wanted to bring it up that you know we can't approach free enterprise and. Right, and we are in complete agreement with you, Commissioner Norton. Um, And that's why I think a letter of warning is appropriate here, just outlining the details of, you know, what you're saying is completely okay. You can sell online and um, you can e-sign and – uh, but in this situation, it's our opinion that, that yeah. this kind of sale in a parking lot where you do all of the negotiations and, and do that is, is not appropriate uh, and that it's considered unlicensed activity. Uh, I did the narrative to make that clear. It wasn't uh, just that they sure. were meeting the Bingo. customer to do paperwork. They were ba- basically yeah. conducting a, a, a sale operation, negotiation, showing of our yeah. – Absolutely. Yeah, and we agree. We're not trying to regulate interstate commerce. We right. don't have the power to okay. do that. And so if anything's right. happening online oh. and fully online and stuff like that, that's a whole different well, ballpark that we're our, not going into. I prefer them leave our Tennessee customers alone. Let us sell them the cars. <laughs> <laughs> In the spirit that's of what true. we're doing. We, we deliver quite a few cars to the state of Alabama as well out of Tennessee. Right. So, and I yeah. think we'll see this more and more. Yep. You know, so I think it is a great conversation to have and uh, that we're clear on what's allowed and what isn't. Commissioner Levy's point, I think it's, I think it's okay. Uh, you know, I wouldn't want to discourage them from doing business in our state right. but i just there's a right way to do it you can't hang a shingle on a parking lot down here and declare yourself open for business you have to negotiate car deals right yeah. and um i think this just since we're talking about it i would like the commission's opinion on what if uh the same situation happened a uh, consumer here saw um this car on marketplace and they met him at the auction is that okay or is that the same if you're doing the paperwork at the auction it's it's is it is it uh, yeah, an auction is no different than a public okay. it's a public environment you yeah. can co- you can consummate a transaction wherever you want to do it i mean where you originate is the, the issue you know right. where did this originate we make it very clear all of our deals originate in the state of tennessee with our dealers dealers that are in tennessee um and that's for arbitration purposes or any any anything but um i think you got to leave it there i mean they're free to move but, about but stan if if a um <laughs> Uh, Commissioner Norton, if you have a customer that goes with you to an auction, that's really against auctions rules. No, I think like what I mean is they were just using parking the lot. parking lot. Like, hey, I'm okay. going to be at the auction anyway, so I'm going to bring this car with me from my dealership, and you can look at it while I'm there and meet me there, kind of thing. Well, to your point, there are a lot. Of, there'll be there's a lot of issues within that because most all Tennessee auctions now are licensed dealers, correct? Right. Yeah. So yeah, they, you, know, you get into some other areas there as well. Yeah, but you do. Anyway, yeah. You anyway, do. I, I think, I'm tricky. glad we talked about this. It clears things up because you know we're we evolved over the past 20 years as you know uh, the internet rules it didn't used to be that way. Now we've got other things to consider like this. But right. origination of the deal and the price, everything has to be agreed upon in the home state. Right. Which can be through um, internet communications. Right. So would you agree that it is the sale should be done before the car's delivered or before they see the car? Most of them are. I mean, like Carvana, okay. Vroom, us. I mean, you know, we, we have a deal. We, we have a car, a car deal that's transacted. It's transacted before. On our, on, yeah, before, before. Okay. We, don't, we don't take cars and then go, you know, haggle prices. That's, that's not the spirit of what it's intended for. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but there, what if? I mean, this is a what if. What if someone goes just to see the car and they do negotiate it? Well, uh, it, it has happened. I mean, you get there and, uh, Chairman, I bring you a vehicle, and you get there and you said, uh, the tires are not exactly like they want to be. I'm going to knock off $500 for the tires. Okay, that's going to happen. I mean, I, I, but that's a gray area, even at that. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think the t- issue is that what you're describing. What you're concerned about, the way it's described in the description, is is fine by your perspective, that they had a deal and they just met to sign the paperwork. 
Yeah. But the investigation revealed more than that. It wasn't just that they met to sign the paperwork. It's that I'll bring the car, you take a look at it, we can discuss pricing. So I, I think you just need to be clarifying that it's doing more than just finalizing the deal. I'd say that your tire example sort of fits within the finalization of the deal. Yeah, I think they came definitely and they, they acted like a pop-up dealership, basically, mm -hmm. for this vehicle mm -hmm. and didn't correspond well, online completely. Okay, so my question is, how do you how do you monitor and manage that? Because what if... What if it was just some somebody's dad that took the car, brought it to Tennessee, and they were still negotiating with the store? Like, it, it, it probably wasn't a sales manager that delivered the car to the guy and started negotiating with him. It might have been a salesman, but in my case, they'd still be communicating back to the store. So. But you wouldn't I'm not know. disagreeing you with would, anything anybody's saying. You, you can't monitor it. To oh, you yeah, can't I really don't monitor think we can. it. We, you, we would have to rely on a consumer complaint. Exactly. Or yeah. what, what an investigator finds when exactly. they're out there so speaking you, to people, which I think is all the inf evidence and information we have. It only gets triggered when the complainant so In this makes particular up. case, if they were still dealing with the dealership in Alabama, some guy was just standing there leaning up against the car watching him. I mean, would that be different? Well, I, I think he would still be making the negotiation and making the sale in person in Tennessee as opposed to online, which is a whole different ballpark. We can't really regulate what's going on yeah. through the e commerce area. Like you said, area. Uh, but well, I think being in person and you are a representing a dealership, a licensed dealership in another state, and then you're coming into Tennessee representing that dealership, you're doing the sale in Tennessee. So I think that kind of crosses over into our unlicensed issues. There's gray, there's gray areas in everything. I think it's gray areas, which is another reason we didn't do a fine or anything like that we just did a letter of warning just to kind of put them on notice hey don't be coming in and doing unlicensed sales it's fine to do it online finalize the sale finalize and you can deliver the vehicle in. here but you're uh, i agree with I you but yeah, is, i do but agree no. i don't know how we would monitor it but you can't know. and what this does it just declares the spirit of intentions of our laws you know basically it, it, it draws a line in the sand they're going to cross it everybody's going to cheat but, but what you can do is well, we don't just that's not open game to do that we're letting everybody know you can't come hang a shingle here without a license you got to have a dealer's license right and we'll catch them if we catch them you know exactly. if, they, if, a, if an investigator catches it or if a consumer complains we'll, it'll be that's it'll right. be told so i mean it's it's clearly the line of defense good work I have one that I, I wanted to make a, a suggestion on as well. I'll change to the suggestion. Number 33 uh, 2023049811. Um, I'm going to go ahead and recommend that for closure for right now, and we're going to look more into the requirements of what is needed for to be a floor planner. So just for now, I'll close it and then kind of and look into it a little bit more after discussion. So, yeah. Those those were basically mine. <clears throat> Dealer didn't respond, uh, and they're just giving. What is the rules? Mine. So um, we operate where we give a letter of warning the first time they don't respond because a lot of the res a lot of the excuses <clears throat> are well you know the per the mail didn't get to us in time and we kind of can understand how that can happen and we're not saying it's okay but we're going to give you one the benefit of the doubt the first time but we we watch that we're very careful about watching that and if it happens again that's when we can find them um, and it would be a $500 fine for failure to respond and that's under one of our rules um, but we, I also want to make it clear that we are very diligent about, we don't just send them one piece of mail, regular mail, and, and say that they haven't responded. We send them a piece of regular mail. We email it if we have email addresses. If they don't respond, then we do a certified mail. We make sure we have a proof that they signed for it. Then if they still haven't responded, <clears throat> Taylor and I or our paralegals will call them. So we, we, we make a lot of effort uh, before we would find somebody for failing to respond. And, um, but, the, you know, and if, if we do find them, that means they've also, that we've done all that and they've gotten a letter of warning sent to them by certified mail saying, if this happens again, we will find you. So that is, that's how we operate under that rule. And if there was at least one where it sounds like there was an internal issue that they were having and that was a good enough reason for you that there's not a... Yes, yeah, that's what that one was. And the letter of warning being the initial step is kind of what the commission had previously Yeah, we had a talked about ago. it. Um, 
but I mean, if that's something we could start with a fine, if that's something yeah. you guys want to do in certain it's situations, in our rule that or, we can find them for it. Historically, from the, I think maybe like last year, we had decided to go with the letter of warning first, but that's kind of at your guys' discretion how you want to handle those going forward. Whether or not someone has a good excuse, maybe that's what's the letter, or if they're just not answering. That's fine. I, I, just, I was just curious if that was if they would make sure that there was a basis for it. Uh, and then specifically, Jackson, oh, sorry. Uh, I think I noticed on a lot of them in the previous cases, a lot of them have not, you know, had a fine. And, and a lot of them have been in a business for a good while, and they have not committed any kind of fine. So I think we looked at it. And then you also, I noticed in a lot of the cases, you looked at the narrative, what was the case all about. So that do make sense when you decide to give them a letter of warning and not give them a fine on the first offense. Yeah, and I, I think we looked into a lot of them where there were some where they did have genuine excuses, like someone like the email change that they have, which it is their duty to change their update, their contact information with us, but it does happen. It falls through. They, they eventually responded when they got it, and they kind of explained that information. So that's why there were some that didn't have them and some that did. But um, I think a lot of warnings is a good start, starting basis because we made clear in there if you don't answer again, you're going to have a civil penalty. Here's the statute that gives the power to do that. Be aware kind of next time. Is there a difference between responding to the complaint and, and working with you guys? Yes. Because it seemed like one of them was a bogus claim. They didn't respond to the complaint, but they were working with you. I can't remember what number oh. it was. Well, so, no, no, they, they only are required to respond Onto to us. us. Yeah. You know. I, I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, there would be no violation if they're not talking to the complainant. It would only be if they're not responding to, to our office. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. I might be yeah, talking about my next one, number 73, where it looks like it was a bogus claim. Uh, from a disgruntled former employee. Is there not a any penalty mechanism for you to go after folks who are just using your offices to uh, grind an axe with a former employer? No. Uh, no, yeah. I, I wish there were because I will tell you, we get enough of them that it's, you know, a waste of our time and energy. Um, but it's not just this program either. I mean, I've worked on other programs and it happens a lot. I'm um, energy and money because yeah. we get dinged for that oh. for the investigation. Yeah, and we, we just can't restrict people who can, yeah. kind of can't file complaints. And then if they don't respond to it, even though if it's bogus, we still have to make the effort to get the response from them. Otherwise, we're not doing our due diligence. So You guys go through a lot of cases to, to, to sort out what something is actually a violation. But anyway, yes. reference to the one you said <laughs> internal a while ago was number 65. And, and I, I, I had an issue or – a question about that. Uh, they did. They said it was an internal mistake. The reason they didn't respond. However, you go back up in the complaint, and it didn't. It addressed. And it, the accusation of respondent of the respondent was title jumping, multiple temporary tags, and forgery. And, and then it went on to say that the the respondent didn't complain because of an internal mistake. But an investigation was done. Were there anything in in that investigation that, that were there too many temporary tags? Were there title issues? None. Nothing. Okay. Yeah, all right. They didn't say that. That's all. That's yeah. All. No. And then the complainant. They have found no issues. They went to the respondent's dealership, found no issues, and they tried to contact the complainant, like, hey, provide okay. us some evidence of where you're finding this. The complainant didn't answer them, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be involved. I thought it was much. When you closed yeah. it, I thought maybe so, but I just had to ask the yeah, question. Yeah, no, nothing going on with that one. Uh, my last one, uh, super nitpicky. Uh, warranty is misspelled in number 61. It's good to know. We'll change it. <laughs> 61. Oh, that one's mine. That's yours, okay. I've got, I've got just a couple. Uh, I'm going to label this one number 99 and a half because it's before 100 and it's after 90, uh, 99. So it's uh, it's the case number 202 Okay. Um, and what was the last three numbers of it? 861. Okay. That one's fine. Okay. All right. So um, on this particular case, uh, there's authorized a $250 civil penalty for advertising violations. This is a common practice become more common in our industry, and we call them hard packs. And this looks like this is what this is, a hard pack. I'm very concerned about this. It's been widely accepted in 20 groups. It's, uh, it violates uh, truth in lending, uh, and, I, and I've got an issue with it. So I want to bring that to the commission's uh, um, awareness to the fact that I, this particular case is, uh, is why the FTC 
that's going after what they're calling junk fees, baits, and all this stuff. I mean, listen, we're protecting ourselves, but I understand when dealers are doing stuff like this, and there's probably another case coming in the state of Tennessee just like this one where they're doing hard add-ons and not disclosing them, not on the advertising, not on um, even the show up. If I, if I agree to sell you a car, you're coming to do the paperwork, you go in, and it's listed on the buyer's order as a hard, we call them, they call them hard ads. That's what this is. That's wrong. It's deceitful. And I'm vehemently opposed to it. I mean, it's. I mean, I'm a greedy dealer. I, I'm, I like to make money, but not at the benefit of wronging customers by uh, not disclosing this on the front end. So it's been mentioned that it's okay to sell products as long as the, the customer has the option to buy it or not buy it. And clearly, in this situation, the customer did not have an option to not buy it. So uh, I don't know what the commission's uh, flavor is for this, but. Uh, I want, it, I want it looked at stronger than $250. Well, uh, Commissioner Orton, I am in complete agreement with you, and I, I really wiggled on this one. I'm like, I want to find them more because not only is it wrong and it's a violation, but the respondent didn't even, like, it, when they responded, they didn't even realize it was a problem I, I, or they didn't admit, like, this, we made a mistake here. It was like, no, no, we're doing everything right. Um, and I don't know if that's a tactic or if they truly believe that or if they don't want to be wrong or I don't know. But that bothers me, too, uh, that they, they think that this is okay or they want to make us look stupid. <laughs> um, but tradition, just to help you understand why I went with 250, traditionally that's what we've done with the first-time advertising uh, violation. Um, but we're not, we're not seeing them a lot anymore. That was when we were seeing a bunch of them and our rules were in the middle of being changed. Um, and maybe there was some confusion. Um, I was tempted to do 250 per violation here, which we could do. Um, we could do 500 per violation because technically there's three fees in here. I'm just so, more concerned overall. I'm not concerned just about this dude. I'm concerned about where we're going. Yeah. You know, when I, I have a 20 group, my general manager heading out to Utah tomorrow or Arizona, and, and they're being ridiculed for not doing this. And it's clearly a violation. I've explored it. I've, I've asked reasonable counsel. You can't do it. No. So, um, you know, and it's, it goes back to the car dealers were given a bad name. I don't know. Somebody helped me out here back in one of the world wars, maybe one or two, where they were regulation against price gouging so the, the used car the dealers were saying okay the car is five hundred dollars but this candy bar is 250 you got to buy the candy bar to go to the car right. that's that's what gave us a bad name to start with right. and i think and i had a consumer uh, a friend who just experienced this recently here in the state of tennessee i was embarrassed to think okay i'm one of them and they're doing that and it's wrong i mean it's not disclosed it's 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 just a it's a gouge and i'm not about regulation i think what the ftc uh, just uh, came out with, and it got delayed. I, I applaud them for their attempt, but it, they went about it wrong, in my opinion, and not the commission's opinion. But uh, but I think that we have to take a position on dealers like this if they start showing up, and they're going to, that where we have to define the rules of uh, of advertising and disclosure, deceptive advertising. And I applaud the consumer for catching this because I can only imagine how many every day how many sales are made where the consumer might not know any better or understand the rules. I know I wouldn't before I started this. So um, I think, well, you know, I, it's I appreciate the overall concern about the problem that we have in our state and that people are doing it, but we need to address this case. Right. It, it does matter, and we do need to figure out what do we well, want There's to nothing wrong with setting a new precedent on how we're going to deal with advertising violations like this. I mean, sure. we have in our rules and our statutes, the capability to, you know, assess a, up to a $5,000 civil penalty per violation. I'm not recommending that here, but um, that is what we're allowed to do. So it's really up to the commission how they well, we want. We raise it to 50 and make it 500. Okay, because this is, I can assure you, this is, there's going to be another case just yeah. like this one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I suggest we go back and look at them again. I mean, so they, we find them $500, what if they keep doing it? Oh, well, if they, if they were to do it again, I would think that would be a very serious issue that you know, we would have if to I know, If I'm a dealer and you're going to find me $500 and I know you're not going to look at me again, I promise you I'm going to keep doing it because it's I – mean, it's we can a, definitely I go this, back and audit. Yeah, I looked at this case because when it was brought to me, not this particular case, but this scenario, because <clears throat> it was brought to me, I looked at it and went, oh, everybody's doing it? Good. I'll take a look at it. I did the math and went, holy cow, if I can make 
You know, we sell 7,000 cars a year times 500. Y'all, you do the math of that. I'll pay $500 fines all day long, but I'm still right. I'm still doing the customer great injustice by allowing that to happen. So anyway, I agree with you, Chairman Roberts. I, th- I think we I think we uh, increased the fine to $500, and I think we monitor it. Okay. Okay. Do we have any? I have one last question on number 123. Um, we the, the recommendation on the original. Uh, Sorry, could you mind to repeat what number that was again? 123. Originally, we discussed this and we agreed authorized seeking volunteer surrender respondents license. And then the, uh, the new information was to wait until the civil case was heard. And I'm not sure uh, why would we need to wait on the civil case to determine if yeah, so this was just a recommendation because their attorney came back and they said that they're appealing the matter and that they do not think that the original finding was correct by the original judge and that they basically are not going to do anything with this until they hear from the civil judge because the only issue with this is let's say they, they appeal it, they win, and it comes back to us, and then we should have never revoked their license to begin with. Okay. It can kind of be problematic, so that's why we were looking okay. at kind of placing it in a litigation monitoring until which they they're supposed okay. to go to hearing in like uh, two weeks, so we're going to hear back Understood. In, yeah. in a short period of time. So it's not going to be like next year, like they have a hearing date set next okay. in two weeks. So kind of just so we can go from there, and then if it comes out the same, then we'll just go ahead and move forward with that. All I got. Number Roberts, you okay? Good. I, I have one um, situation I'd like to bring up to the commission. Um, it's not about anything on this report, but it's something that I've, has been brought up to me, and I would like to know how you feel about it. Um, if a dealer was to sell a vehicle to a consumer after they bought the vehicle from auction and did not, they say, they did not realize it was salvaged until they or the consumer went to register it, and blamed it on the auction for not giving them the most recent title. Does the commission feel that that is a possible situation and we should give them the benefit of the doubt? Or is that just an excuse to try to get out of uh, a violation? Well, first of all, we've got to protect the consumer in that situation. The consumer's made whole. Uh, past that, it, uh, I mean, if it's clearly, if they had no knowledge of it, it's between the, the dealer and the auction. But as far as as far as the consumer, as long as the consumer is made whole, that's between the auction and the dealer. So that is a possibility that an yeah. auction could miss a salvage yeah. vehicle, and and it could okay. Absolutely. And as long be, as yeah, it as, could be because of just the fact that the timing of it is it was so recent, it didn't get a chance to be on the title. It, it could not be on the title. The, the t- timing of that could be, or it could be the title was washed, which B Tyler would prevent this, by the way. Uh, or or, or uh, the, the the auction could use some some auctions use dealer, uh, Carfax, some use uh, the other uh, Experian products. So it just depends on what they're looking at. It's essence of timing, though. Okay, so as long as the dealer makes the consumer whole, we wouldn't need to assess a civil penalty. As long as the consumer. Okay. okay. My opinion. My, okay. my opinion. I, I think but that, well, that's what we're ultimately here to do to serve. Absolutely. Yeah. But the but the, the auction has rules. They're by N triple A they have rules that the, the dealer is protected. So the auction will have to take that up with the, the dealer will take that up with the auction. Okay. Or the auction with the dealer. That's it. Thank you. Hey. Anything else? I have a motion that we adopt the report as amended, subject to the approval of the full commission. Approved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. In opposed, ayes have it so ordered. We declare the legal report meeting closed. At we'll take about a two-minute uh, <laughs> short break. And uh, anyway, the, the, there's a notice of public comments uh, to be held at the end of the meeting. Do we have to sign up for that, Neil, now? Do you have to <laughs> sign up to speak? Is there anybody that wants to at the end of the meeting? Now, if you're, you, if you're on the schedule, then you'll get to be heard anyway. But unless you're just a public 
uh, just somebody from the public that wants to speak, you can at the end. Okay? All right. Uh, Executive Director Lawrence, will you call the roll? Commissioner Andrews? Commissioner Barker? Present. Is present. Commissioner Copenhaver? Present. Is present. Commissioner Elam? Present. Is present. Commissioner Evans? Present. Is present. Commissioner Galvin? Present. Is present. Commissioner Jackson? Present. Is present. Commissioner Kramer? Present. Is present. Commissioner Levy? Present. Is present. Commissioner Melton? Present. Is present. Commissioner Norton? Present. Is present. Commissioner Owens? Present. Is present. Commissioner Speaker? Present. Is present. Commissioner Vaughn? Present. Is present. Commissioner Watson is absent. Uh, Commissioner West? Present. Is present. And Chairman Roberts? I'm here. Yes, present. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. And I apologize for not uh, introducing our new uh, commissioner, Copenhaver, from uh, Johnson City. Yes, sir. And so we're glad to have him with us. Um, meeting notice, uh, Denise, was sent out. Yes, sir. This meeting's date, time, and location have been noticed on the Tennessee Motor Vehicle Commission website included as part of this year's meeting calendar since November of 2022. Additionally, the agenda for this month's meeting has been posted on the Tennessee Motor Vehicle Commission's website since January 16th, 2024. This meeting has also been noticed on the TN.gov website. Okay, we need to adopt the agenda for the uh, meeting today. Mr. Jackson, motion that we adopt the agenda for today. Commissioner Vaughn, second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The agenda is adopted. Uh, the minutes were uh, in our package for the last quarterly meeting. What's your pleasure on the minutes? Make a motion to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. Second, Commissioner Galvin. Any further discussion on the minutes? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Like sign. Okay. Minutes are approved. We have um, one uh, dealer appeal or a, a license appeal coming before us, and I believe it's Carlos McMahon. Okay, if you would come on up. Yes, please do. Make sure the speaker button is on. And lean kind of down to it, because if you're back from it, we can't it hear you. That's good. Okay. And uh, introduce yourself, to, uh, or well, actually, we need. Uh, Carlos. No, we we actually need other attorneys to give us a briefing on this. Chairman, this is uh, an appeal for Carlos. Hey. Mac Mahon. Yes, sir. Uh, it involves uh, four felony counts of sale of a controlled substance, and. Um, this is under code annotated 3970. I want to correct some information on your Fresh Start Act memo, um, which says that you would have discretion to deny until 2025. The applicant has actually clarified on his appeal that he is on parole until 2028. So the commission can certainly question him about that, but if that's the case, the commission would have discretion to deny until 2023. Until when? 2033 if it's the case that he's on parole until 2028 because we would add if that ends his parole you would add five years and so the commission would have discretion to deny until 2033. Okay uh, let's hear from Mr. McMahon. McMahon? McMahon yes. Sir. Okay uh, tell us uh, about your situation and give us some good information about what's what's happened. Oh, okay well um, in 2010 I was I just made some bad choices. Um, I was selling uh, Schedule Two, which is cocaine. Uh, trying to make some easy money. It's the only charges I ever had. I got sentenced to 20 years for it. Only time I ever been in trouble. Uh, no misdemeanors, no prior records before then. I was a part of the U.S. Air Force. I got out. Uh, just made a bad decision. And uh, I'm still paying for it to this day. Like I said, I never hurt anybody. Never hurt any uh, hurt any family. Uh, never hurt. Um, good. Got a strong core background. It's just that I made a 
bad decision in my life. And uh, they sentenced me to 20 years. I was uh, incarcerated from for four years on it, got out on parole, been out ever since. Uh, like I said, I was in a prison with people who's done hurt kids, murdered people, done a lot of things. They didn't have 20 years, but I got 20 years for selling uh, drugs. The only time I ever been in trouble, and uh, like I said, I still pay for it to today. Uh, worked hard to come out and uh, just try to get my life together. Found a job with Mr. Mike Nim down here at uh, Newton Chevrolet and GMC. Great, I love working with people. I always love helping people. Uh, it's in my, it's in the town where I'm from. I'm a big community man. I do a lot for my community down there. I went to college at UT Martin for football. It's just that uh, that one, those one, those incidents that I chose to make easy money cost me a lot of, a lot of time in my life. How long were you in the uh, military? Four years. I was in the U.S. Air Force. Right after college? Yes. Okay. I, I went from 2004 to 2008. Did you actually use the drugs or did no, you I was just, just sell? Just sell, yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Norton, I was looking here, but you can tell me, help me out. When did you get out of prison? Uh, 2016, sir. So what, tell, us, tell us what you've been doing since 2016. I uh, started when I got out. I had a, uh, I was already in a, in a business that was doing restora restoration. I did a lot of restoration work. Uh, one of my best friends opened up a business, and so um, where if like storm shelter, it's sort of like uh, Surf Pro. So if you have anything happen to your house or business and things like that, I did that for a long time. Uh, and then I went to the pest control side of it. Really didn't like all the stuff, the chemicals and things, because I'm like 41, so just inhaling the chemicals and things like that. So, like I said, uh, I put it in for application uh, at Mr. Mike's uh, Newton Chevrolet and GMC. And uh, like I said, I just found something that I love to do, love working with people, so. During that pest control and restoration, did you, how many companies did you work for? Uh, just two. Just two? Yes, sir. And that was, uh, how long was that? Uh, I worked until I got, um, I worked from when I got out of prison in 2016 to this year, this past summer, when I uh, was able to join uh, Newton Chevrolet and GMC. Tell us a little more about yourself as far as your family. Do you have children? I have two kids. I have a 20-year-old son. His name is Isaiah. He was born with brain damage, uh, so he's mentally challenged. He got a disability, but to overcome all that, he graduated high school, got his driver's license, got his own place. I mean, uh, overcame a lot of challenges for him. That's my uh, firstborn. I got a daughter that's f just turned six on the 18th of this month. Her name is Isabella. She just started kindergarten. She's my baby. I love her. <laughs> I love all my kids. Uh, she's spoiled rotten. Uh, I do have uh, my mom, my stepdad, my brothers and sisters, a lot of nieces and nephews, a big family, a big support group. I have a big support group. Even though I made the bad decisions, I still have a, a lot of people from the community behind me in Shelbyville, Tennessee. That's where I've been all my life, like as far as when I went to college and then I went to the Air Force. Uh, loved by a lot of people. I mean, even though, like I said, I made a, a mistake, uh, people still, res you know, people still respect me. People still like me and didn't, didn't hold it against me at all. So, you know, I just, just love working with people. I love making people's day. I love making people happy. And that's what I found when I, uh, by working with Mr. Mike and them. That I'm just really good at what I do. And it's just I just like it, and uh, like I said, uh, I just just love people. I'm a great people person. The questions for him before we go to him. Uh, uh, Commissioner Jackson, on the you said you've been working for the pest control control company, and. Are you still working for them, or did you quit when you applied for? I I, I left them when I, I got hired by um, by them. Yes, so I still I'm still licensed for I'm licensed for mitigation. I'm licensed for pest control. I got a license in a lot of, a lot of things like that. So I'm certified. I'm certified in those departments. I was also doing project managing, <coughs> of course, things like that with the restoration company, and uh, so I got a lot of licenses in water water damage, fire, smoke, and odor. Uh, like I said, pest control. And it's just a chem dealing with a lot of chemicals in there, just inhaling them chemicals and dealing with that. It's really it just, I just didn't really think in my, my long term, 
I was just looking out for my long term. So, like I said, I applied with them, uh, got an offer to come in for an interview, kept it honest about my felonies because it's my only one. Uh, another thing, I was in Iraq. I got deployed to Iraq in 2004, August, and uh, been over. Uh, I mean, like I said, I seen a lot, did a lot. I was deployed twice, once in 2004 to Kirkuk, Iraq, and then again in 2006 to Talil Ali. And the first time I did, uh, I was deployed in Iraq. I did mortuary affairs. Well, I didn't like do the body was just bag tagging, shipping. So I saw a lot, and uh, you know, it's just memories. I, 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 I still live with today. But uh, I do. I, I love like I love my country. I serve my country. Like I said, I just made a bad bad decision, and I still live with it today. But I just. Uh, once again, I can't express how much I love working with people and working for people and doing what I do. Uh, Commissioner Jackson, just one more. So since you got incarcerated, you got out and went to work uh, for this uh, restoration company, and then you went to work for the, the pest control company. So you, and now you, you're working for this, the dealership. So you have not had any problems since then? No, sir. No, no sir. Staff, no. Is, is it any, any information as to whether he'd been arrested since he was out for this. The only information that Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 28, somewhere around in there. Uh, my sentence was in. I had to talk to my parole officer, which I meet with her probably twice a year. She calls over the phone. It's very simple. Uh, we do evaluation each year. And uh, I saw it's around 2028. I think I don't know what actually month or day it is, but I know it's, it's been pushed back to 2028. Okay, that's all I have, Chairman. Commissioner Vaughn, have just one or two questions. So on your application, it says that you made restitution in full. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you haven't been in trouble since? Oh, ma'am. Okay. No further questions. Hey, you brought somebody uh, in support of you. Uh, you tell us who you, you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, my name is Mike Avendanza. Um, I am a car dealer. I own um, six dealerships, uh, four in Tennessee, and then one in Alabama and one in uh, Kentucky. Um, I'm here to support Carlos. Uh, I've, um, I wouldn't do this uh, typically, but um, just stands out in a positive way uh, amongst our employees. And we all know like right now we need, uh, in, in our business, I guess in any business, um, people that have good core values are something that, that we take very seriously. So that's why I'm here, so. Commissioner <clears throat> Galvin, uh just to reiterate uh, with Mike, I know Mike pretty well. I know his dealership. I know how his operation. Uh, he runs a great operation uh, with all his six dealerships. Uh, and if he thinks that an employee is bad, he will get rid of them. But if he thinks that they have a chance and they're good, he'll stick with them and will give them a chance. Um, with this in mind, I would say I would recommend that we give Mr. McMahon uh, his license. I would recommend that. Is that a motion? That is. I'll second the motion, Commissioner Norton. Uh, any further discussion? Executive Director Lawrence, will you call the roll for the vote? The motion is to grant Mr. McMahon his license. Commissioner Levy? Aye. Votes aye. Commissioner West? Aye. Votes aye. Commissioner Melton? Aye. Votes aye, Commissioner Elam. Aye. Votes aye, Commissioner Speaker. Aye. Votes aye, Commissioner Copenhaver. Aye. Votes aye, Commissioner Galvin. Aye. Votes aye, Commissioner Norton. Aye. 
Votes aye. Commissioner Vaughn? Aye. Votes aye. Commissioner Jackson? Aye. Votes aye. Commissioner Kramer? Aye. Votes aye. Commissioner Owens? Aye. Votes aye. Commissioner Barker? Aye. Votes aye. Commissioner Evans? Aye. Votes aye. And Chairman Roberts? Aye. Votes aye. Mr. Chairman, it is unanimous. We will issue Mr. McMahon's license and actually we'll issue that today electronically. Oh gosh, don't do that. Um, <laughs> We'll issue it electronically today and we'll email it to you and then we'll put the hard copy in the mail. Congratulations. Thank you for your service. You. Yep. I, I would just like to thank all of y'all for giving me the opportunity to uh, be in a business that I, uh, I've grown to love in a few months that I've been in it. I just want to say thank you to all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. Appreciate it. All right, you're ready to go. Thanks. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you. Executive Director Lawrence, you got a report? I do, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. Let me get to it. Um, we are uh, rolling along as usual. If you'll notice on your um, on your report page. We have uh, 91 new dealers who've opened or relocated, and um, our total dealers statewide is 3,355. Uh, we are, it, it looks like our representative number is going back up a little bit. That got reduced somewhat dramatically over the last year or so. Um, we've opened 166 complaints and closed 84. Um, and then we are currently collecting our um, annual sales reports. Uh, let's see, we are licensing on an average of 2.3 days, and that's including the time it takes for people to get back in touch with us when, when we have to wait. When we don't have to wait, we're licensing in about one and a half days. So I'm pretty proud of my team. They never seem to disappoint, and I'm thrilled about that. Um, we uh, included the disciplinary action report in your meeting materials, and I think we've got about $37,000 out there to be collected. And that is all I have for my, oh, I have one other thing to add in sort of as an aside to the director's port, report. We were asked during uh, one of the last meetings about the, um, the issuance of the temp tags, of the easy tags for 60 days. And I reported that we had heard from Revenue, who asked us to take down from our website uh, verbiage that said you could get a second tag up until now. Apparently, Revenue's changed their minds, and they are going to continue to issue a second 60-day tag. I don't know how long that will last or, or how long um, you'll be able to do that, but I just wanted to let you know that that change has taken place and we've instructed our inspectors to you know not issue notices of violation based on two temp tags so we did leave that language off of our website i understood that revenue was waiting for sort of an educational period to get all of the uh, dealers up to speed but is it at our discretion or is it at, do you have to <clears throat> need it or ask for it, it the system has been set up so that if you just go in and print out another easy tag, if you've only done one for that car, you can do another one. What a second. Okay. So, um, I mean, and you obviously always have the option to, to contact Revenue if you have a special need, but um, I just wanted to clarify that because I didn't want to confuse everybody as much as I'm confused. First question was that was it easier to allow that to happen than to make an amendment for Shelby County? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I was told, well, we haven't changed the system. They can still print out another one. So I thought, okay, they just really want me to educate our dealers and let them know time to stop doing that. But if you're not going to cut the if you're not going to cut it off, then there's no point in doing that. And so the last time I checked with my contacts at Revenue, they said, no, you can still issue two tags. So, so did, how will that be communicated when that changes? 
Because that seems to be the issue. Nobody knew and still don't. A lot of people still don't understand when it's supposed to change. So. Well, we'll probably just cut it off based, <laughs> yeah, based, on, based on the information that I got, I did a communicate, I did an email blast to all of our dealers saying, guess what, you know, we're, we're now adhering to the new law, only one 60-day tag. And, you know, when I asked for further confirmation of that, I was told that that was wrong. And um, as they changed. So to answer your question, the minute we hear anything differently from revenue, I will communicate it with dealers. And I, and I always copy you all on all those communications. And the trade associates, Gaya has and T and I have both been put in their newsletter, so. Yep. I apologize. I can only report what I'm told, but sometimes selective memory is at work. So, oh, that concludes my director's report. I apologize. Okay, legal report. Uh, we we need to adopt the director's oh, okay, report. That's right. uh, Commission Jackson, a motion that we adopt the director's report. Commissioner Vaughn, second. Further discussion? Let's take a roll call vote on uh, the report. The motion is to adopt Commissioner Levy. Aye. That's I, Commissioner West. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Melton. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Elam. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Speaker. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Copenhaver. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Galvin. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Norton. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Vaughn. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Jackson. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Kramer. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Owens. That's I, Commissioner Barker. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Evans. Aye. That's I, and Chairman Roberts. Aye. That's I. Thank you. You have approved the director's report. Okay. The legal report is next. And before we do it, I want to make an announcement of a congratulations to Erica for getting engaged. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Didn't know if anybody else knew it, but I found out, and uh, I think it's great. Thank you. That okay. is a surprise. Just don't leave us, okay? Yeah. I won't. All I won't. Right. Y'all are too good to me. All right. Motion to approve that. <laughs> <laughs> right. You want to hear about them, right? Yeah. 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 We didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see this from there, so I think as long right. as you approve of that. No. Thank you very much. I'm very blessed. Very blessed. Um, okay, so the legal report, we just have a few amendments that I'll go over. Uh, number 33, we are going to close that. Um, number 56, we will be closing and flagging that matter. Number 61, uh, oh, I just, I misspelled something. We've corrected that. Number 75, we are still closing that, or I'm sorry, we're still, um, we've still authorized that civil penalty, but we're also going to refer it to the Attorney General, or authorize the letter of warning, I'm sorry. Um, number 99, we uh, have amended the civil penalty um, to $500, and also we will be monitoring the respondent's advertisement for some time to make sure that it's not continuing. And that, uh, that is all of the uh, amendments to the legal report. We have a motion to accept Commissioner the legal? Jackson, motion that we adopt the legal report as amended. Okay. Second. Second, Commissioner Barker. Further discussion on a legal report? If not, uh, Executive Director Lawrence, will you call the roll for approval? Yes, sir. The motion is to adopt the legal report as amended. Commissioner Levy? That's I, Commissioner West. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Melton. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Elam. That's I, Commissioner Speaker. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Copenhaver. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Galvin. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Norton. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Vaughn. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Jackson. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Kramer. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Owens. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Barker. Aye. That's I, Commissioner Evans. Aye. That's I, and Chairman Roberts. Aye. You unanimously adopt the legal report as amended. Okay, next is uh, legislative updates. Neil, do you have something? I believe that's the chairman's. Oh, you want me? Okay. Yes. That, okay. Excuse me, I missed the cue. Um, anyway, yesterday, um, Assistant Commissioner Martin, Executive Director Lawrence, and I before, uh, appeared before the the Joint Government Ops Self-Sufficiency Committee, along with multiple health-related and commerce and insurance regulatory boards. 
uh, we received uh, we were received positively and no actions were taken. Uh, there will be no report as we uh, there will be there will be more to report as we move forward. Uh, please be aware that we will be scheduling committee meetings between now and our April quarterly meeting. Um, so please keep your calendars open, okay? And uh, that's all I have. Do we need to uh, adopt that? That's just, that's just information. It's just information, yeah. All right. Um, audit, there's nothing. Um, rules. Rules committee didn't meet today because right. there's some verbiage changes that we're going to look at, and so that'll be on a future date. In new business? Old business? Public comments, I don't believe there's anybody else out there except Tim. Well, one other person. Um, okay, we can make a motion to adjourn if you'd like. Quick question. Um, for the next quarterly hearing, is there any indication that we may or may not be having a contested hearing of any kind? I guess maybe I'm asking any updates from our friends from the scheduled. last contested meeting towards the end of the year. Are they playing nicely now? Oh. Yeah, we haven't had any updates about that, so... My hope is that they are. <laughs> yeah, we have not Everybody heard anything since playing before, nicely. so. Well, Broadway. Yeah. Like this morning, so. <laughs> so hopefully. Okay. So no, no, does or that or any other. As of right now, no. Like yeah, well. no. Mm -hmm. If anything comes in, then Denise will send you guys an update. But as of right now, no, there's nothing scheduled. Hey, do we have motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Commissioner Bowen. Commissioner Jackson, second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? I bet there won't be. <laughs>